I, I have to uh, give Andreas credit because he's much more of a salesperson than he gives himself credit for. When he called me up and asked me about um, coming, of course, I immediately said yes. And then he said, well, you have kind of this spot where you are following some people and we want to kind of minimize some of the repetition. I really didn't have a good concept until about lunch <laughs> as to what he had gotten me into or I'd allowed him to get me into. Uh, so in the interest of risk management, we'll see what, what kind of job we did here. Um, we'll start with a couple of questions. I don't know if, you, if those are up. Great. Now, I'm going to answer these in the course of the presentation. So if you want to write your answer down uh, or just remember, uh, we'll revisit these. Okay, what if I know your answer but I disagree with it? <laughs> I would be disappointed if you had not asked that. <laughs> Vote twice. You got two chairs. <laughs> we getting about there. Interesting. Okay. So this is a percent of crashes that can be prevented without getting to full autonomy. All right. You, Brad and I were debating this, and as I said, we'll answer these throughout the presentation. So if we want to go to the next one. <laughs> Interesting. So the <clears throat> essentially higher end wins. Okay. I'm actually so impressed that so many were at 50 and not 75. This is the, this is actually the question I'm most interested in seeing how the answers come out. <clears throat> okay. And I think we have one more. So this question is really describing an operating system kind of like you'd have for an iPhone or an Android device or a laptop. <laughs> okay, we'll, uh, as I said, we'll, we'll revisit these and um, we'll move forward. So autonomous stuff, real briefly. Autonomous stuff is the largest independent distributor of autonomous control systems and perception systems in North America. Let me put that in perspective. If an auto manufacturer wants to make a thousand of something on the production line, they'll go directly to a tier one supplier. If they want to make one or 10 or 100, a generation or two out for research and testing, then they call us. And so we have a very interesting and I would say unique horizontal perspective across what's going on with um, unmanned vehicle systems, uh, both, or I should say not both, but marine, air, and land. Now most of it's cars, and that's the um, part that we're gonna talk about. And during the last couple of speakers, I had the good fortune of going, running in the back and eliminating about 17 slides, <laughs> thanks to all the prior speakers. Um, I wanna challenge you though today to think about a couple of issues that haven't been clearly articulated. And mostly what we've heard, and rightly so, are questions. What about the risk? What about deployment? Let me challenge you with this perspective. Nobody is in a better position to answer those questions than a reinsurer. The most important question that you all have to wrestle with is who is going to define your role? Well, we have to step back for a second because nobody in the insurance industry yet is stepping up to create it. And this is such a quantum shift that you really can't think about it in an incremental change perspective. So who do you want to define your role? Second, all of this essentially boils down to a $64 million question. How good's good enough? How long do you let 85% of the fatalities occur because you can't solve 15? There's an ethical question. And so, 
Who better to help the world understand the answer to that question than a global view from experts at the top of the intellectual food chain in an industry who know how to quantify risk? If the insurance industry as a whole sits back and lets these questions get answered for them, I don't think they'll be as happy with the answers. Jane opened up talking about the fundamental mission of insurance is to make the world a safer place. For the insurer who steps up to accelerate the deployment, accelerate the safety, that is definitely making the world a safer place. Is it just a continuation of the mission? The stakes are huge. And I would submit to you, because of some of the idiosyncrasies in the United States, like 50 state insurance commissioners, which is just the system that we have, right? That there are places like Europe, like Asia, where the answer to these questions may be easier to arrive at because of the opportunity to scale up and scale down. But the stakes are huge. I talked with folks outside of the insurance industry in terms of the crash economy. So what I mean by that is, think of the combined ratio of 100%, combined ratio of 105%. So roughly 105% of these numbers flows through the insurance industry back out into our communities in the form of claim payments, jobs, lawsuits, it is a, the insurance industry at its most basic level is a way of organizing cash flow. This is a $200, $400 billion disruptive, disruption to this cash flow, and that does not include the impact on the bond portfolio. Now, one of my goals for today is to help put forth for your consideration a framework for thinking about this. And in order for a real breakthrough to occur, you have to have an alignment of three constituencies. You have to have the technology, you've got to have the business, and you have to have a consumer job to be done. It's very difficult to align those three because everybody speaks a different language, everybody has a different goal, and consequently, historically, it hasn't happened very often. It happened in 1915, when the advent of consumer credit and, and the introduction of auto insurance combined with the consumer job of mobility combined with the assembly, mass assembly line. That was the last real breakthrough in transportation 100 years ago. Ever since, it's been pretty incremental until now. So with those three, what I would like you to consider is not only is this shift going to happen, but that it has to happen. That our model of low occupancy, personally owned, fossil fuel based, is not even viable moving forward. And I'll show you why. If you accept the fact that this is going to happen for whatever reason, then the next question is, how fast? And I will tell you it's accelerating, and I'll back that up with some numbers. For the very first time, we can ask ourselves a question that, sure, we've been able to ask in the past, but we've never been able to answer it. Now, Brad brought up teleporting, and I'll bring up another one, light speed. So as long as we're not talking about light speed and teleporting, generally we can ask this question, and the answer is, yes, we can do it. Because of the cost collapse, of technology and the growth in capability. So, do we want our transportation to do these things for us? Done. Now, I'm not saying we should, but we can. And for people that are involved in urban planning, I work with states who are looking at these technologies and looking at building planned, un de planned developments for retirees of, say, 150,000 units. And the decision they have to make is, do we just put a parking garage at the entrance and tell them no cars in the city? Because we can do that now. Do we want the car to do these things for us? Okay. 
We can do that. But here's the more important point. Each one of the things on this list, which is by no means exhaustive, is a revenue opportunity for somebody who steps in and decides they want to provide that service. And the field is wide open. The stars are aligning again because we have this mass urbanization, this list of issues that we've already talked about. I want to jump to the bottom one for a minute because the numbers are so overwhelming and because we drive every day, we kind of take it for granted. So let me ask you a question. How many people flew to get here? Okay, go ahead and keep your hands up for a second. Now, um, we, we've talked about how many hours people spend commuting. Think about that in terms of hours waiting in line at an airport. And four airplanes drop out of the sky every single day. You don't know where, why, or which airline. But it happens. Four 747s every 24 hours. Now, how many people would fly to get here? We do it every day when we get in the car. At the end of next year, we will have repeated the fatality count of World War II twice since the end of World War II. The WHO, CDC have labeled fatalities in cars a preventable epidemic, which brings up an interesting legal question. What if the technologies are labeled a vaccine? Here we have the global transportation snapshot, and, and really look at the motorization of cars per thousand. China's up to 85, India's at 16. I want you to remember those numbers compared to the US and the EU, okay? Because right now, about a million people a week are migrating from rural India to urban India. It's an unprecedented human migration. At 16 cars per thousand, because of the land needed for a car, New Delhi will have to dedicate a parking garage two times the acreage of New Delhi to handle the cars. It's not gonna happen. If that isn't kind of silly enough, let's talk about the 300 million people migrating from rural China to urban China. At 85 cars per thousand, Beijing and Shanghai need a parking garage that is the acreage of the US state of Pennsylvania. Here's where it gets even funnier. Air quality on a bad day in Beijing is 300 times worse than the WHO safe level. In fact, according to MIT, that air quality has only been officially measured in one other place, an Alaskan wildfire. What happens if that 85 cars goes to 440? It's not viable. At a number, at some number between, four, between the, Euro, the uh, EU and the US in cars per thousand, if China hits some number between the two, the rest of us don't have any gas to buy. Now these are silly statements, but it just shows that the numbers are there to say that our current mode of transportation isn't viable anymore. Therefore, this change has to happen. So what about the technology? We talked about Moore's Law. I'd like to talk to you about running ahead of Moore's Law, where the collapse in the cost per unit enables safety and deployment at a pace that would shock most people. Case in point, and I verified this over lunch, High resolution sensor, uh, LIDAR, several years ago, $75,000. A couple of years ago, 50. This past year, um, doing some installations on test vehicles at 20,000 in six months. Retail price, $250. The, think about that capability at $250. Right? Now you're starting to talk about affordability. And that, by the way, is a leading German uh, company. So there's these levels, and I, it's, we'll, we'll get the levels reconciled. I would like you to think about the cars in three bands. You have the connected, um, which there's a variety of opinions on, and then there's the fully autonomous, 
I think the space that I personally think we're gonna live in is kind of this messy cooperative. So, so what I refer to as the cooperative car. The car where the control is seamlessly exchanged between the human and the machine in a way that the machine augments the human capability. Now the reason this is important is because think of your pay by mile pricing. Now think of this diagram. What happens if telematics becomes the full integration of the driver behavior, the vehicle behavior, and the 360 degree view of the world around the car? Asking how we're gonna figure out whose fault it is when something goes wrong is not the right question because we're gonna know with greater precision than ever before exactly what went wrong. Asking what you want to do with this data as a potential revenue stream, as a growth opportunity, you have to start thinking in terms of this full integration at a 3D level. Modeled crash trends in 2005, 7, 9, 11, and 13. And what you see is an acceleration in the decline of crashes. Well, what about PD frequency? Green line being uh, actually a forecast from Mercedes back in 2005, and what you see is actual experience falling in line with a NHTSA forecast and the Mercedes forecast. What about fatalities per 100,000 drivers? An accelerated decline. But what's fascinating about this is that these charts don't reflect any of the technologies we've talked about so far. The insurance industry is already being disrupted. It probably started five or six years ago and it took uh, the self-driving car for us to kind of wake up and go, wow, something's changing. I mean, everybody talks about frequency going down, and with the ADOS technologies, we have two first, right? So with forward collision warning and some of these other technologies, what you see is two first. Double-digit decline, that's unprecedented, and double-digit decline simultaneously in severity. Historically, what's always happened with severity when frequency's gone down? Severity's gone up. What happens when both start declining by double digits? So, this is a heat map of a vehicle, right? And what, what the point of impact is. So, when there's a, when there's a, something goes south, how often is that part of the car, regardless of fault? And these are numbers from five OEMs on various forms of the technology, so forward collision warning, adaptive headlight, which had the largest decline in severity. These are just the frequency numbers. The severity numbers match. I will tell you on the blind spot detection, what makes a difference is whether it's a nudge or a warning. Nudge is better. Now there's a question that was in the pop quiz at the beginning. And what if I said that we're only gonna get about a 15% frequency reduction from full autonomy? It would not make a lot of sense. It's a little counterintuitive. The real issue is we can eliminate 80 to 85% of the accidents, and this is the number that Brad disagrees with me on, with greater situational awareness and a low level of autonomy. In other words, the technologies that people are buying today. It really depends on which technologies go to market first. Because if I flip that pyramid and say we just go straight to autonomy and there'll be some connected aftermarket later, we're still at 85% reduction. Here's my point and the, what the insurance industry largely is missing. The industry, and I realize reinvented is a big word, the insurance industry will essentially have been reinvented by the time we get to full autonomy at scale. Looking at the driverless car or the autonomous vehicle or automated 
fully automated driving as a place out on the horizon someday where we need to start getting prepared will be too late. That's called Kodak. The change is happening already. Now, according to the Texas Transportation Institute, you don't have to have a big fleet penetration to have a dramatic impact on traffic. According to the Texas Transportation Research Institute and some other sources, roughly 45% of all stop and go congestion is due to accidents in the cities. If you eliminate the accident, you can eliminate 45% of the stop and go congestion, and you have a watershed event for the electric vehicle. 24% deployment, which was another one of our questions, can eliminate 45% of the stop and go congestion. Why? Because, and by the way, 24% deployment doesn't mean 24% fleet turnover. It's the network effect. So yes, if the one car has 360 degree situational awareness at 300 meters, which is roughly 10 times our eyesight, it is essentially making all four cars around me that don't have the technologies a little safer. Not prevent, not block, but a little safer. More importantly, with each additional car, you get a compounding effect. This is augmenting the human capability. Not science fiction, being purchased off the lot while we sit here. So, if I had two or three more hours, I would go through the assumptions in this. This is gross top line personal lines premium for the US. Now, before I get anybody runs for the windows, um, <laughs> I'm not saying this premium is going to go away. It may shift. Somebody is going to step up and define the answer to that question. But in the current model of personal lines auto insurance, as we know it today, that's what we have forecasted here. And this is with a 50% decline in frequency. Now, in case you think that's too aggressive, these charts also include a 1% annual increase in severity. We did not even contemplate a decline in severity. What if you get standard on all new vehicles, and you have a slightly faster rate of deployment, you have a slightly faster impact or greater impact, and then what if you have a viral adoption? And what's interesting about this, I want to point out real briefly, is that when I first did the forecast in 2011, and then, or in between 09 and 011, so you had two years between forecasts, that an impact point on the graph moved up two years. That kind of made sense. There's a small acceleration. Four years later, though, that same impact moved up six. Again, what we're seeing is an acceleration of impact. This is an era where you can't afford to not test your assumptions. Music to my ears is when somebody says that can't happen, or that'll never happen here because that means it's probably pretty close to going live. It would just, it takes a very broad horizontal view for that to happen. There are some wild cards to watch out for, and I wanted to leave you with some signposts. So legislation is one, aftermarket is another wild card because at $250 for the highest level sensor, you start to get into a lot of folks doing things at home. So here is this quiz from before, and the correct answer, $5. There's an app for that. You can download a forward collision lane warning, lane keeping warning app for $4.99, put your phone on your dash, and have a forward collision warning device. You can't do that with an airbag, right? You can't do that with ECS. This is different. 
Other question was plug and play. And the plug, this plug and play operating system was developed by a company called Harbrook. Um, it was essentially unveiled recently at an autonomous vehicle summit in San Francisco. I will tell you the response has been overwhelming. What it does is essentially allow, it handles the processing of all the data regardless of the sensor manufacturer, cam camera manufacturer, or vehicle type. Suggested the price for their plan with is 30 bucks. So it's already been developed. This takes care of 85%, 80 to 85% of the programming needed for autonomy. Data is also at the real core of this transformation. And so how should we think about this? And, and this is going to be closing in a slightly different way, and I would just ask you to kind of bear with me. My role at Autonomous Stuff is I work with companies in a consulting comp capacity, helping them find the opportunities that they want to go after. So small budgets, large returns. And because this is the reinvention of mobility, it's not an incremental change. And so it takes a fresh perspective. Well, I think it's going to go. I mean, it's enough in the back. There you go. So pretty much everybody in the insurance industry faces a choice. You can be disrupted or you can disrupt. Disruption that's self-imposed is much less painful. And that's where the real breakthroughs come about. Some insurers will resist, some are studying, others will agree to participate, but the industry leaders are going to be the ones that accelerate. We are looking at new designs and new materials. It isn't just ADAS. You have new body materials, you have these entirely new designs. Once you significantly mitigate against the accident, it's open Pandora's box for design, vehicle type, drivetrain, and all of a sudden you are faced with a much different world. An entire new industry is going to be the recycling of electric vehicles, for example. Who's going to do it? For anyone who has worked with families or had to help put them back together again after crashes, if we only achieve these results that you see in this video, it would be worth it. But in fact, the societal benefits are a whole lot more impacting and much more significant. And when you've got crash rates that could decline at that pace, you have to think differently about your business. Buckminster Fuller said you can never change things by fighting against the existing reality. If you really want to change a model, you make the existing model obsolete. The insurance company and the industry has the opportunity to go to its workforce, go to its vendors, go to its partners, go to OEMs, and say, what can we do together? And the company that does that will be the company that leads and answers all of the questions that we've brought up today. It is an opportunity to be at the absolute crossroads of history. And that's not overstating it. It's a time when people will be nervous. There'll be a lot of questions that have to get answered. But you've got to decide whether or not this is optimism or pessimism. And it is very much about our choice what we choose, not blame on the outside world. That won't cut it. This is a wide open opportunity to create new products, to collaborate with the people who are doing it every day, to be the outlier, and I would encourage you as you seek ideas and toss around concepts, seek out the ideas of those outliers within your organization as well. We're running faster than Moore's Law at the increase in capability and the decline of cost. 
In fact, making an autonomous vehicle looks a lot like that graph on sequencing a human genome. You don't have to be first, but you don't want to be last. You probably don't want to be fifth or sixth. And so with this new era of mobility, you can bank on the fact the majority of companies, because it's true in any industry, will just see the disruption and get paralyzed. They'll freeze. They'll study. They won't act. Those that do act and accept trial and error, accept bumps in the road, accept things don't always work out perfectly, are going to be those that lead an exponential change. Closing out, I would start with some really basic questions. And those questions are things like, where are we going to get ideas from? Do we want to create our own future? Do we want to be responsible? Which is a gutsy call to make. Also, are we willing to answer questions like, how do we define innovation? What does success look like? Start with the basics. Because the opportunity is that big. Is innovation a wonderful space like you have here for dialogue? Is innovation a tactical result in the marketplace? You have business models like Airbnb that go from zero to a market cap exceeding their competitors in four years. You can't assume viral won't happen because when the consumer decides that there's an opportunity, then the companies who take advantage of that opportunity are the ones that are successful. The insurance industry is being challenged, not just by ADOS, but by the shared economy, by the fact that three and a half billion people are going to come online for the very first time over the next seven years. They're not even in your market today, but they will be. Last, transportation is one of the few capabilities, few technologies, that is directly connected to every single one of man's great challenges. Humanity's grand challenges are all impacted by transportation. Now, you don't get overwhelmed by that. You can just focus on making the world better for one person. But at the end of the day, it's a question of where do you want to go from here? What's your next step? Do you sit back and wait for other people to answer these questions? Out of all of the companies that I've had the pleasure to be in front of, there are only a handful who can decide, no, we're going to answer them for everybody else. And you're one of them. Thank you very much. Wow. <laughs> all right. Time for drinks, almost. We have to wait till 5 p.m. till we get uh, some drinks, coffee first. But do we have any questions for Guy before we're heading out for a coffee? Coffee restaurant. Coffee. Help. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so maybe Guy from my side. If you were working right now, in insurance, in the reinsurance industry, mm -hmm. right? You were in charge. What specific actions would you take? What would you recommend? Or what would you do? Because you're in the driving seat. I had the, um, there's a, a couple of, so there's a couple of steps I would take. I had the pleasure in 2010 um, of uh, merging onto Highway 101, 4.30 in the afternoon from the back seat of a Prius during rush hour. Now, obviously, there was somebody in the driver's seat. But inside of about five minutes, my whole perspective on driving, I knew it was never going to be the same. Because of the cost of the technologies and the capabilities, you have the opportunity to retrofit three or four of your own corporate cars. Get first-hand experience to get a handle on the perspective change would be number one. Number two is reach out to um, Auto manufacturers, tier one suppliers, reach out to people who could you have good relationships with that um, could be collaborators because it if 
if you don't step up and help them answer these questions, they're going to get into the market on their own and at least collaborating with them and uh, gives you an opportunity. Third, finally, I would have a very systematic defined process for vetting new ideas and deciding which ones you want to go to market with and which ones you want to and what and what your boundaries are, what your tolerance your risk tolerances for innovation and new ideas. Those are the three steps I would take coming out of today. Okay, thanks a lot. So, so I'm in, in thanking Guy Frey.